I'm so glad all the chairs are filled up. <laughs> so, um, this is the second of the, the three talks which are planned here at uh, Nottingham Art Exchange. A new art exchange, rather. I keep on calling it Nottingham Art Exchange for some reason. It always, for me, the two things so coalesce. Um, and they accompany, of course, the Rashid Rana exhibition. So the, the talks are geared towards looking at things which come out of Rashid's work. Um, and the format this evening, I'd just like to just quickly talk about it, just so that you are aware of what I'm trying to say and do is that the first 20, 30 minutes, I'll try to talk about some theoretical ideas, realms, structures, observations, which for me have helped to define not only the digital, but maybe the photographic domain, um, which we'll look at, which is what I'm interested in looking at and deepening. And after that, I'll spend around, let's say, seven to 10 minutes on each artist, and there are six artists that I'll be looking at. And possibly none of these artists will be known to you, uh, maybe only one who uh, is Paris to Faruha, who maybe some of you know, know about her, and I'll talk about her. Uh, I'll start the talk with her when I, when I talk about the artists. Um, and what I'm going to try and do in the first part is to introduce three clips First is a little clip about me, with me and Rashid talking. Um, then a clip, which is by uh, Jitish Kalat. And finally, a little clip by Paris too, which will kickstart the whole um, look at the artist's observations and why they make work. And a lot of people always think about the notion of digitization as a series of experiments. And of course, I'd like you to think about that as one way of looking at it. But I hope that later on when we do have a, a little question and answer scenario, we can think about beyond this notion of experimentation. New media is not so new anymore. It's been around a long time. And we need to sort of maybe go beyond that. So by, by now, most of you are aware of Rashid's work downstairs. Um, maybe you've seen it a couple of times. And of course, you know that some of his work is very provocative in the way that he uses the digital domain, which in a sense helps him to facilitate looking at his environment and maybe restaging some of that by making it fresh, by giving it a look which is maybe helping him to re-articulate the contents, his history, the history that he's surrounded by, but also, to a large extent, the amount of data that he basically collects and the specificities of those data, the moment of what that data means. When we did this talk, which was a, a talk between myself and, and, and Rashid, approximately a month ago, we explored his work very much in, in general terms. And one question that came out, which is really interesting, was, was a question about, does he use the notion of landscape in his work? And he, if I don't know, there's a couple of you here in the room who were here when that question came about. He, suggest, he suggested something which Jung has talked about, which is this idea of a personal unconsciousness, um, which is to a certain extent the end product of everybody's failures or one's particular failure. When an individual has a failure, whether it's not being successful with the environment, whether it's not being successful with their family or with society, to a certain extent, you start talking about that. You try to crystallize that. You crystallize those fears you get yourself tied up in knots thinking about your failure. And in a sense, this sort of place dishapes your self-image and the image of your environment. 
So when Rashid was asked about whether he's incorporating or will incorporate the notion of the landscape in his work, in a funny way, I felt there was this moment of failure of not being able to do it. He was thought, I can't do it straight like the notion of the landscape. I don't have this relationship to the landscape. But what he suggested that in the last generation of artists, an artist from Pakistan, whose name was Khalid Iqbal, had a relationship with the landscape, the traditional notion of a relationship with the landscape. There wasn't a failure of acknowledging that. So, and this artist had seen the Pakistani landscape as a Punjabi landscape, a very specific traditional way of looking at the landscape, and maybe a very kitsch way of looking at the landscape. And he said... What he did was he looked at considering somebody like Rashid who saw, uh, looking at somebody like Khalid, who saw Rashid, the next generation, as being westernized, therefore having this notion of failure inbuilt in him not to be able to look at the notion of the landscape. So how Rashid said he looked at the landscape was very different and maybe we can play that little clip. He talks about it. I hope he plays a clip properly from the YouTube. Accordingly, if you can compose things about both Rashid's career, his ideas, and his work. So I do think that what Rashid is doing at the moment is incredibly important. And I know that when I've worked with people in India, they've also found his work very important. Um, and that's something which is also maybe we can touch on at a later stage. Because I'm not sure if this is the right place, but we'll go through it anyway. I know that many of you are familiar with Rashid's work and have maybe had the chance not only to see the exhibition downstairs, but possibly also had a prior look at it at the Listen Gallery in London and maybe at the Corner House in Manchester that um, Arnold just talked about. I've been familiar with Rashid's work for a number of years, having worked with him with an exhibition which I curated in Mumbai for Bodhi Art. Right, right. we'll cut it. It's not the right Bodhi. side. Everywhere. We got it wrong. It doesn't matter. But Rashid, what I, what I wanted to get at with that, with that YouTube clip, maybe we can find it later on for you, was he talked about this remaking of looking back at the urban landscape as his landscape, rather than the notion of the landscape as was talked about in traditional sense. So in a sense, there was a notion of failure. And that notion of failure was interesting for me in terms of how artists, art historians, curators, to a certain extent even audiences, are now considering looking at both the notion of contemporary nature and what is our, our relationship to the notion of traditionality, modernity, postmodernity, and how are these mediated between, to a large extent, the here and there, and in, in, in relationship to that, that example of Rashid, the here being now contemporary, and there being modernity in terms of the artist Khalid, because there's a great split, especially in Asia, between contemporary and modern. And of course, not here and there in terms of just that modern and postmodern split, or modern and contemporary, but also now and then. Now being something which is considered in the 70s and, and then could be something which is now, if you know what I mean. The inside and outside, where Rashid is seen as somebody who goes outside to learn and then comes back inside, and somebody like Khalid who learns inside and then is maybe taken on board outside. So all of these splits, all of these sort of ideas, dualities, become realities for artists who are working today and also how audiences look at themselves, looking at art. It is intriguing in a way that both generational differences are mediated, but also become, in a sense, meaningful in the way that art, especially in Asia, is not only sold, but is, in a sense, administrated, historicized, and put forward. So artists who are contemporary and working in India of a certain generation, for instance, or even in Pakistan, 
are seen as modern artists. Other artists of another generation are seen as contemporary. They're both living and working and showing at the same time, in the same place, but there is this big split. I'm interested in all of these sort of nuances which have come about making the art world into something which is very difficult, especially from people from the outside, trying to work out what does it mean when I come to see this exhibition. So when we look at this title of this talk, Asia in the, uh, in the Age of Digital Imagery, we are looking at artists whose lives and whose works have got all of these comp uh, complexes that complement each other, all of these ideas which fight against each other, these dualities to a certain extent, are not only about digital technology, but also of now and then, there and here, beyond, inside, outside, all of these things come into play. So the term digital itself becomes problematic in the sense that it affects the language as well as the process of making art. Digitalization or, digi uh, or digital technology as such is not something which is just a process of recording, coded, possibly storage, or sending as a signal, de decoding it, receiving it, opening it. It's beyond all of those things. It is a process that most, most of us do not understand, but yet most of us use it on a daily basis. It engages us as a kind of intervention, as an invention. It is embedded in all the utilities that we use every day, everywhere. It's pervasive. It is part of our security. It monitors us. It provides entertainment as well as is used for medicine. We are, in this room, most probably surrounded by more technology than is necessary, and we are, in a sense, living within the digital realm. But as such, what has it done to us, and what does it do for artists who are using it in Asia? Now, this swamping and the use of technology is something which is very valuable in many ways, but it does need a lot of unpacking beyond the idea that it allows us to communicate. It is, to a certain extent, has its particularities and very specific way that it plays, it, it plays a role for the audience. Many people get very excited by a digital framing of work, uh, you have something called Transmediale, for instance, in Berlin, which is very attractive to many people. Because it's a dedicated space by artists and galleries, museums and publications of all sorts that uses and foregrounds the notion of the digital within the art, within the artist's realm, and within the curatorial specific specificities of making exhibitions. So we have arrived to an extent where audiences, artists, as well as institutions are presenting and packaging, not only in the Western institutions, but all over the world, the notion of the digital work or the work coming from a digitalized space or the work being digital in its own reality. What I'd like to do is to just take Hopefully, we're at the right place this time. A quick look at a second clip by the artist Jitish Kalat, based in India, who delivered this little speech at the Global Symposium in Vienna. And it's a two-minute clip. Hopefully, this time, we're at the right place. Can we collect this, the points of contact with the global, as our title of our session says, what is the relation of global art to regional development, global local interdependence. So I'll probably go back to the collections. Um, so I'll just start reading. Is the art object GPS coded by default? Is it embedded with a geotag 
and can we cite which part of the globe it is coming from? Despite the fact that the artwork uh, is essentially a warehouse of the artist's deep investment in a place and time, a theme and an ideology, how is the embedded metadata of its creation, such as location and time, uh, of its making, ideally unraveled by the viewer participant? Do artworks deserve a, a certain kind of location neutrality so that they are not domesticated or incarcerated by the superimposition or an overemphasis on the sort of socio-cultural backdrop of the place where they come from? And does this apply across the board for art that comes from any part of the world? If not, does this create some kind of a viewing asymmetry when it comes to seeing art from certain places vis-a-vis -vis others? In other words, if we you know, pick a catalogue uh, of the kind of exhibition making that's become quite popular these days with large institutions, which is now being called a survey group exhibition. And normally these come out of places as India, China, Iran, etc. And if you look at the, uh, the aspects of the exhibition, such as you know, the exhibition title, the graphic design, uh, publication design, or sometimes even the text that accompany the project, um, we often see that artworks get propelled with a certain kind of certain form of assisted reading through the foregrounding of a certain kind of local information that then becomes the sort of overall framing device for the artworks in this project. Of course it is counterproductive to ignore this kind of local specificity and to create some kind of a flattened, universalized kind of discourse. So, you know, that would be highly counterproductive and one isn't suggesting that. But are artworks from certain parts of the world more susceptible to a form of over-summarized and hurried prefixing of local specificities, whereby they are granted a kind of compromised global mobility through a projected provinciality? You know, so does this become this kind of, does the artwork gain its mobility through this framing, which, you know, which is a kind of complex sort of thing that keeps popping up. I'm reminded of the fade in publication Fresh Cream, Contemporary Art and Culture, to which both Maria Lind and uh, Gerard wrote. All right, so what I think is really, really important here is what Jitish is trying to say, which are very pertinent observations. And somebody who has been involved in looking at that sort of glo the global contemporary, in a sense, where the regionalized, um, where the geographically contextualized is embedded in visual discourse, it is something which is an evolving process. It's something, as he suggests, does have this kind of metadata which comes out of an external field. what, to some extent, Paul Gilroy has called the kind of multiculturality of arriving or the arrival. It's not so much as a globalization of a dispersal of ideas. This is what we think. What I think is interesting is the way that Kalat, as an artist, even expresses himself in the languages, in the language he uses and the key words he uses to describe this idea of being in the global realm. And this language, to a certain extent, is also the language of digitization. He, he talks about meta tags, GPS coded by default. These are really interesting ways of looking at geographies, looking at cultural differences, and looking at the notion of glo the global art world. So when he talks about <coughs> exhibitions and artists from Asia, <coughs> to some extent from local locales outside of the Western sort of hegemony. He talks very much about the strategic way it is found to be having a specific root or the root of how it has arrived. And I think that, to a certain extent, also talks about our institutional mindsets into about, about the notion of differences and of no, notion of arriving somewhere or what has arrived in our, in our realm. Rather than we are, in a sense, part of a geography, a vast extended geography, it seems to me that what he's talking about is that there's a kind of an imposition. And that imposition, to a large extent, 
is how then the artwork is viewed. So to a certain extent, if we look downstairs, we could say we're looking at Pakistan rather than we're looking at a photography exhibition. It's what is foregrounded and what is in the background is what's kind of interesting in the way he talks about the notion of contemporary exhibition making. So he talks about this notion of an asymmetry of viewing. He talked about artworks getting propelled by assisted readings in design, in the way that we foreground certain information and we kind of sort of forget other bits of information. He talked about the notion of local information being important <clears throat> as a framing device. And all of that, in a sense, leads what he suggested to a provinciality. It, again, in, in, in our, our notion, our ways to make something cosmopolitan, we end up making something other, we make something else out of it. Possibly this space, New Art Exchange, is also part of that problem. But as a curator, I've used geography and the notion of the location in the way that I explore exhibition making. And especially if you're working in Western Europe, nation states from outside and locales outside of Europe are hard, difficult, complex things to introduce to a community which is always inwardly looking. Issues and ideas, even important aesthetic developments, cannot be evaluated sometimes without, in a sense, forming some sort of cluster for them to be, in a sense, recognized. And it's this dedication, sometimes using a geographical dedication to a space, to a place, to a time, to a history, that creates a kind of sense of programming or an identity for certain parts of the visual arts. And to a certain extent, sometimes the plethora of other positions which are very similar doesn't have that identity. So sometimes you look at a gallery which is showing everything and everything and you kind of find yourself, I don't want to go there because there's too much of everything. Once something is slightly a bit more focused, that focus provides a certain audience key to go in and entry. So geography, histories, and specificities to a large extent can provide a sense of projection which is positive and negative. It has to be that there has to be an interest in making sure that these important innovations and maybe subjectivities are dealt with in a way where there isn't a kind of a geopolitical flattening, which happens a lot of the time. We address very strange entanglements of histories and complex things like um, large, long histories of colonialism, let's say, by just making it into something like, this is a globalized, now we are post-colonial. What, does, what are these things? What do they mean? One has to be sensitive. One has to be careful. Geographical curation, to a large extent, should go beyond this sort of shameful stereotyping, but also an overfencing. You know, it's, it's, it shouldn't be sort of like held like a small child. It is grown. Some of these artists are very confident. Some of these dialogues and discourses are very deep already. So, how do you enable, to a certain extent, all of these things to happen? How do you create a space where the depth of knowledge in the global field is not completely dependent on these stereotypes, is not resourced by giving it a kind of a halo of a political space? And as Kalat says, it should not be completely GPS coded. In a sense, it shouldn't be just, this is happening in Pakistan, this is happening in Iran. Don't entrench it in such a way that it then smacks of this sort of shallow way of viewing its contents. Don't tag it 
by creating what we used to call in the 70s and 80s and 90s samosas and saris, which is how, to a large extent, multiculturality grew up in Britain and how it led to the notion of culture diversity. Looking at art, looking at culture, is not an exercise just in addressing and endorsing a public policy. It's not a kind of a soft tolerance. It's actually about championing the influences of the global creative environment. And it's so incredibly important to show this competitive nature, which shouldn't be, as I said, based on bias or artificial barriers, but as a way of understanding the world that we all are living in together. So in some ways, curating from a geographical space or a locale or a specificity can be what Spivak calls, you have to use this, this notion of strategic or employing strategic differences. And I think what she meant is that we are, we are now working with a vast, enlarged territory called the global realm. Some of these places, like for instance, especially, let's say, in Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, have uninterrupted visual histories, unlike China, which was interrupted by the Cultural Revolution. But they do have a language which is indebted to war, is indebted to colonialism. It is what we call visualities, where it has had a transformation of its language through these external forces which have come in. So using this notion of strategic differences, one can look at and retain this vast archive of pre-colonial and post-colonial influences. And what we get, possibly, is a truer picture of the historical invention of a visual language from one country or one realm or one space, one geography. And we become, to a certain extent, much more educated and have a visual cognition which is based on a real recognition of differences rather than very specific ideas of a culture through a very shallow way of, of admitting it being here at the same time as everything else. So I have, over the last sort of five years, actually longer than that, I've been looking at a lot of artists from Iran and India. It's been an extensive period with maybe around 10 exhibitions with other tangible outputs, including publications, conferences. And I've used both these strategically essentialist ideas um, and elements to try to allow a complexity of images, materials, scales, particular cultural factors, in a sense to explore both the idea of the self that comes out of these spaces as well as the collective condition of where the work emerges from. In a funny way, we have to think about how has the artist and the artwork traveled from its natural home, the high might, to maybe a mobile but fallow destination called abroad. So beyond this sort of notion of the saris and samosas, which is in a certain way become more Bhangra and Bindis and Bollywood. There is even in that, from food and textile, we've shifted to film and music as a kind of essentialization of cultures, of Indian cultures, let's say. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, as we are going to be looking mostly at lens-based work today, I've divided, to a certain extent, the work between those two domains. Um, I'll start with the work from Iran, and then I'll follow with the work from 
India. Now, because most of the work that I'll be showing and most of the work which is produced in both of those countries at the moment is photographic rather than video work, I think it's quite interesting to take on a couple of quotes from photographers who have noted what the craft meant, what photography meant, and which, in a certain extent, can be imposed in how we read these photographs as a kind of a, a, tra a trail, a way of looking at what they're trying to do in these spaces of working in India and working in Iran. The photographer Arnold Newman once said, photography, as we all know, is not real at all. It is an illusion of reality with which we create our own private world. And to a large extent, um, most art photography has that very strong relationship to the notion of the private world. It differs greatly from the notion of street photography in that sense. Whilst Gary Vinogrand suggested a photo is not what's photographed, it's something else. Suggesting, again, something else about the way we have so now closely aligned ourselves with photographic practices and images that we're looking at it for something else ourselves as audiences. And especially in terms of Iran, Ansel Adams says, and he doesn't say this about Iran, I'm just using it as a way of talking about what I think it can be, how we can use photographic discourses to talk about certain places. When the words become unclear, I shall focus with photographs. When images become inadequate, I shall be content with silence. And this is something which we'll follow up in the next talk next month when we talk about the notion of censorship and silence. But these three quotes are kind of important counterpoints as far as I'm concerned, and I'm only talking about what I know here, in how and why photography, and more recently, recording through the digital realm, has become so important in Asia, and especially in India and Iran, amongst its artists. Not that these two countries are similar or have reached a platform that can be suggested to be equivalent within the creative industries, or do they have access similarly to the digital realm? But for sometimes different reasons and for similar reasons, its employment, in a sense, provides an adequate, efficient way of expressing oneself. One specific area, of course, has been the relevance for artists who work within their fields as activists. Now, this is a term which is used frequently by a number of people involved in the arts. But when I was looking and reading um, <clears throat> a French philosopher, Jacques Ranciere, he made absolute sense when he said, I think the intellectual impossible and the material impossible are connected with one another. And I found that really a nice way of thinking about how artists try to make work about possibly the impossible around them. And they, in a sense, have to find a material reality to make it in. So as far as I'm again concerned, it are these sort of ideas behind making something, as Ansel says, and so Adam says, when something becomes unclear, such as words, he uses photographs. So it's at this point, we have to think about this notion of, is this relationship between trying to make something clear, which is an artistic proposition, trying to make sense of the senselessness, which to a certain extent is part of a reality, especially in a country like Iran at the moment. How do you become, to a large extent, 
and activists within this realm using digital photography. Now, I'm just going to digress a tiny bit about Iran. I'm not Iranian. I don't live there, but I've visited it quite long, many times. And everything there is, in a sense, made out of the situation that they can work within. So one has to think about how can you work in a situation where you are under control and under surveillance most of the time. So an exhibition in all the galleries in Tehran, which is there's only about less than 20, they only last for two weeks. And the reason is because within those two weeks, it's finished, it's over. So by the time the people who come to control it, it's finished. By the time they've heard about it, it's finished. So they cannot come to something which is already finished. So in a way, you have to work within a situation and a system and to be clever enough to go around it. If it's going to take them less than two weeks a week, then they will have to make the exhibition for a week from now on. But they know it will take more than that for it to reach those people who are so, in a sense, there is a kind of proficiency in using the digital in the same realm. It is a process that allows the impossible to be recorded and to be hidden. It allows a state of operation which is, to a certain extent, in a sense, provides a focus to store, to remember, to think about the situation in visual terms. Some people think that, in a sense, the use of media is specifically about consumption and access. It does provide a lot of access for the rage that exists in certain domains. It does allow a way to think about what is going on around you and to gratify that somehow by expressing it in a way that it can be hidden and recalled when, the, when you want it to be. And again, I'm expressing what happens in a place like Iran. It has a kind of a desperation built into a process that allows the process then to make that desperation. If there's an allowance in it, in a sense that an expression can be happening. You, you know, if you have a large painting or a large sculpture, you can't hide it. If you have a large installation, you cannot hide it. But if you have something digital, it can be hidden in an apartment very, very easily. And a lot of artists make work which can only be shown outside, which is only in the digital form and then printed outside um, as an artwork. So in a sense, the digital can have the power, if it's used properly, to provide both a social consciousness, an expression of it, and to an extent, have a dialogue which empowers the community when everything around it is to silence it. It allows a structure, it establishes a structure is, in a sense, a breakthrough medium for a number of artists. It creates a body of work which is invisible and possibly visible when the artist wants it to be. It provides its own context by the way that it operates. And it complements the subversion in the street and the manipulation of the street and the manipulation which is done within a digital realm. In a strange way, the media theorist uh, Lev Manovich talks about the idea of a modernist collage. It always involves a clash. And he talks about the modernist collage using the digital realm as something which is a blend 
the blending in a sense this time, I mean, I think he was talking more about the way that images are blended to create a third image. Max Ernst talked about it creating a, as, a, as a different image when you put two different planes together to make a third image. So to some extent, he talks about it as an electronic and a software collage, which gives it a blending. What does that mean, blends to what? In the Western sense, it's, it's an aesthetic development. In terms of Asia, it's a reality. It's, it's a blending of a different sort. It's a clash and a blending, a blending away from, rather. So in that sense, the notion of activism is very pertinent in the way that we'll look at the three artists from Iran, which we'll start now. We'll first look at the work by Paris to Faruha, who actually lives in, um, in Germany, but always explores her work in Iran once a year, and she'll explain why in a little clip, hopefully. Andy, are we there? All right. Can we start that third clip, please? And then we'll be followed by two other uh, artists, Katayun Karami and Raha Rastifad. Let's talk, let's just listen to what Paris 2 has to say. It's very biographical detail. Books are shown. There are certain expectations and cliches which are instantly evoked. In my work, I only seemingly meet this expectation, playing with them instead. I try not to offer the Western gaze a good look at the Oriental, but to turn this gaze into my central theme, namely the patterns which are used when constructing the Orient. I try to observe, so to say, how I am observed. I take visual elements uh, from the Oriental cliches familiar to the West and transfer these into a new context Elements are deconstructed, their meaning expanded beyond the familiar in order to inhibit easy and unquestioning uh, perception. By deplacing familiar signs of ethnic and gender um, projections, I try to visualize the instability of their meanings and create structural irritations. Whilst many in-between spaces are developing, which withdraw themselves from familiar ways of classification, analyzing these spaces, displaying them, and broaching the issue of how they arise is a central point of my work. In 1998, the story of my life took a new turn when my both parents, who were the active political dissidents, became victims of a series of political murders executed by the Iranian Secret Service at their home in Tehran. My efforts in pursuing the case in, Te in Iran had an effect on my personal and artistic sensibilities. Political correctness and democratic coexistence lost its tangible meaning in my daily life but also the forced upon ethnical identification, which I always felt, took a new turn with the assassination of my parents. As a result in my work, I have tried to distill this conflict of transfer of meaning, turning it into a source of creativity. I have tried to deal with parallel questions of identity and cognition in different cultural settings. Now I would like to show you some examples of my work in the, uh, of the recent years. The first work is called Blind Spot. So, um, we have a, a clip of a film, uh, animation that she made, which we're going to view in a second. Are we nearly ready for that? Yeah. But just before we do that, I just want to introduce a, a, a short quote from Victor Bergen, which says, as I've already said, I see the critical task of art today as that of offering an alternative to the media. And in that sense, it sets the stage to what Paris 2 is doing. Which media? How is the media controlled? What does it say? Why is it saying it? And what do I say about it or away from it? So we'll just look at this one-minute clip of her animation and look very carefully at what's going on. I'll just move out of the way. 
Maybe we can have the first slide now. So once a year, she, um, she exhibits a lot around the world, but once a year she exhibits in Tehran on the anniversary of the death of her parents or the execution of her parents. As such, she plays with the political context of what, what is Iran and, in a sense, demands a reflection on a moment. In a sense, providing an alternative history an interplay between what's one's own idea of the world and, to a certain extent, what is the other idea of the world. And, to a certain extent, she plays by working between tradition and modernity, between the categories of male and female. So, if we can have the first slide, please. So all her work, to a large extent, is based on the notion of torture and scenes of torture. To a large extent, 1,001 nights are dragged into the glaring light of the museum, the gallery. To a large extent, she presents them sometimes as beautiful ornaments. It's only when you get close by that you see the depiction. There is a great stylization involved in her work. They're like comic-like, computer-generated images, sometimes like wallpaper, but they have their own ornamental vocabulary. These are letters of violence. And they're repeated and repeated all the time. In a sense, it's about that brutal cruelty that repeats itself in the world and in her world that she's talking about. Beyond animations, a lot of the work are digital prints. Sometimes, as I said, produced as wallpaper. Sometimes as flip books, so you hold them in your hand. And out of all of this, kind of this specific tension comes out, arises. The stoning, the whipping, the beating, the cruelties, which we have to some extent become very familiar with Guantanamo. These are the things that we worry about and think about of what's going on and which she knows goes on. The punishment by stoning, the frightening actuality of the same world that we're living in at the moment. She, in a sense, holds in her hands the experience of knowing what has happened within very close proximity and how things work out and what things happen, what things happen, which are not seen as criminal but as state. And to a certain extent, she counteracts that by producing these works. There is, in a sense, a shift that is part of her idea of what she wants to do with this work. It is about looking at the power apparatus, which is Iran, and also, to a certain extent, compelling the viewer to look at the differences between what we know and what she knows. The next artist is Kata Yun Karami. And again, her work... to get a distance to this. Can we go to the next image? All right. So these are images which were taken during the riots that followed the 12th of June elections in 2009 in Iran. At this point, there was a kind of paradigm shift for the artistic community, but also the people of Iran. They started recording a lot of these images on cameras and hiding them because if you were caught with these images, you weren't allowed to have because you weren't allowed to explore the reality that you were facing on a daily basis that had affected your lives and your families and the streets, which were now destabilized communities. 
So she presented these small digital images which can be produced within your own home and shredded them as if, in a sense, allowing them the expression which is to be, uh, which is the structure of the power expects of this image, to shred those containments uh, and notions of what was going on. And she presented them in the exhibition I did in Berlin in this manner, where she put them back together as documents which had been destroyed and then, in a sense, re-represented in the form of destruction. But it talked about the destruction, again, of the society and the infrastructure of the society, its barbaric reality, and a point which is, it sees itself as modern by being part of the Islamic tradition. So, to a large extent, it, it has this kind of Orwellian look about it. There's a haziness. These are newer images that she's produced. Images which, again, relate to these which had been desecrated um, of herself and her family, which have been digitized to cre create this sort of wavy line as if somehow a powerful other source was destroying something which was held precious. They all become cringed. They all become sort of plastic which is burning. There's a cell sense of destruction always in her work recently. This is about the collage, the torn, the placing together of more than two forms, a process. Here, can we go back to the last one, sorry. There's a kind of coupling of two realities. Neither one of them suit each other. There's a form which is destroyed, but also pain in destroying that form. So all of the time, both of these artists are involved in trying to come to terms with the domestic which is inside and the societal which is outside. There's a sort of dichotomy inside, outside, in the streets and in the, in the world of Iran. But they remain uncompromised, most of these artists. Even if they're censored, they make them as national images and of experiences. The next artist is Raha Rastifad. She actually now is living in exile to a large extent. Not exile, I wouldn't say exile. She's living in Berlin. And I'm again going to introduce you this through a quote. Don't change the images yet, please. I'll, I'll tell you when to, yeah? Um, it's a quote from Paul Miller, who's also known as DJ Spooky. And he says, it's a question we face every day in our world of media overload. Realism is old news, but we're left with a simple question. If the eye of the perceiver is just as important as what's perceived, we face with a dilemma between the material world and the immaterial processes we use to portray, portray it. And to a large extent, what Raha Rastifad does is that she, she works in a, in a museum in Berlin and she's an active artist. So she places her, her contemporary ideas within, in a sense, the fold of a conserved place of museology. So this is history and the contemporary being articulated in the same space. This series is called The I and Somebody Else. And these are names that she comes up with. This is I and Anainin, the writer. She, in a sense, creates a digital collage of an invisible meeting of two people within a historical reality. This is Amrita. I forgot my name. Amrita, a very famous artist from India, 1930s. We want Sundaram's aunties. Oh gosh. All right, he'll come back to me. Of course, you all recognize Angela Davis. So what she does is she bleeds again 
like we used earlier on. This sort of contested relationships and invisibility, which come out of a historical realm. She makes them part of her own body, in a sense, mirroring herself. This is with the portrait of Farouk Farouk Zad, who was a very important uh, filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, and a poet who died tragically very early in, in Iran. They are like mediatic auras. In a sense, she continues to make them part of her own identity. She is, in a sense, able to recall these things which we recognize, these bodies, these great beings who are framed by fame, if you recognize them. I didn't recognize one of them. Can we go to the next one? This is Nina Simone. Is it? No, it's Billy Holiday. Sorry. I'm too, too near to these images. So in a sense, these, all of these women present, are represented because they have, in a sense, triumphed individually, but a lot of them have also had disastrous personal lives in a world that looks at talent sometimes, consumes it and belittles it and often destroys them. In face of such adversity, she looks at these women who've been on the front line in trying to summon some sort of equality by bringing them back out again as part of the contemporary, a relationship back to her. Can we go to the next slide? This is Frida Kahlo. So in a sense, she talks about that prejudice history. Generations, to a certain extent, to a certain extent again, generations, generational, and how we read that world. Especially now, when a lot of these images, especially Frida Kahlo, has become part of the process of grand commercialization and heritage, which has been, in a sense, trivialized. Can we go to the next? And this one is called I and Persia. And of course, it's the use of the veil. So now we turn to the three artists from India. The great art essayist John Berger once wrote, the camera relieves us of the burden of memory. And to a certain extent, it's, it's, it's a good conclusion to hold, to a certain extent, uh, of the work of Beiju. So these are very different ways of looking at the process of digitalization. Beiju has been producing paintings, and, and to a large extent, very large-scale paintings on canvas for a number of years, around 15, 20 years. Not so fast, please. Now, go on to the next one. When we look at his work, his works are always interrupted by these glitches. And the reason why this glitch, to a certain extent, appears is because images, when they are sent around the world, often end up with glitches as part of it when it, it comes to terms with what it's sending and what it's being received. They're like glyphs. The word glitch is quite an interesting word in a sense that it means a short-lived fault in a system. And of course, he's talking about the transiency of the system of, of, of sending and receiving, which is in the digital realm, where the digital corrects itself. So we have this notion of troubleshooting. So this is just prior to troubleshooting. It hasn't finalized. The image arrives, but it's not the image you sent out. And it's in the computing and electronic industries that they call this circuit bending, this idea of something like how to make a video game completely, absolutely clear every time you play it. So you're not playing something that looks slightly different. So how the skin can become absolutely brilliant when you're playing these games. So it's about human recognition, cognition, and the nature of things. 
he suggests that his personal view of human history is nothing but a compilation of tracks, traces, overlaps, and debris left over from collisions of worldviews. He always suggests that his main concern is an overlap between scientific technological description of the world and the traditional metaphysical description of the world. That's how he describes what he does. It is about relocation of memory, of spaces, places, markers. And in a way, to talk about the counterpoint of relocation. How do we experience our realities at the moment? And to a certain extent, he stopped to ask us to think about it to a certain extent when we receive these sort of images. Now, if you look at the, the, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, it's, it's how, to a large extent, most of us recognize the first attack on Iraq came in like that, with a lot of glitches. Because they were done at night using a uh, night vision camera, and they were sent directly to places like CNN and 24-hour newsrooms. And it arrived to the glo global arena as a terror attack, which was full of faults and signal faults. And I think, to a large extent, he uses this notion of the slippery. The, the word glitch actually comes from a Yiddish, which, is, which, means, which says glitch, which means slippery. So the next person is Lina Kejriwal, who lives in Calcutta. We can go to her first image. And Lina's work is very different to the other work so far. She has been photographing Calcutta for the last sort of 20 odd years. She used two major books on it. And then has made three large scale installations with digitized images. The first part of her work is relocating this tradition of the babus and bibis, which are the sort of gentrified aspect, the middle class and the upper middle class, who created after and during the, the colonial centralization of Calcutta uh, into the center of the Indian in the sense of India at that time, of Bengal. For her, she uses that as a starting point to talk about the personalities and the people and the peopling of how power was administrated. What were the habits of these babus and bibis? They took on all of the traits of the middle class, umbrellas, walking dogs, meditating, drinking tea. And she, she works with these images of contemporary spaces in Calcutta of course, on the right-hand side, there's a Netaji, the, the politician, and the gathering of men in certain power places and houses where they talk about certain things. And she made three large-scale installations that followed one after the other. The first one in, in, uh, in Calcutta, the second one in Delhi, and the third one actually in Tehran. And the more she was working with these installations, the more she got into using the work of local uh, non-government organizations to talk about this relationship between gender and space, especially in the history of prostitution that occurred during uh, hundreds of years in Calcutta, and to some extent the relationship of that history of prostitution, gender, and the contemporary sort of slavery that happens and the idea of medieval spaces and places that allowed these things to happen. And she did it by looking and addressing the notion of behavior, both learned behavior and class behavior. So she talks about taste, she talks about space, she talks about the notion of enrichment, in a sense of power, and how the behavior of the ancestors, in a sense, allows the platitudes 
Here somehow, the seams of modernity are encrusted with a kind of a village mentality and idioms in a place which is supposed to be revolutionary. She interweaves religions, spaces, languages, vestiges of colonialism. They all sort of coexist in this capital of British India and the epicenter of the Bay of Bengal. She starts to question the current dynamics of what is being talked about, what is being said. Who are these women in the background waiting? What is being done, in a sense, in these hidden corners and niches? Of course, I I don't know how many of you know, the red light district in Calcutta is one of the biggest in, in, in India, has been. It was attached to the British Army, and where the British Army went, it went with it, and it finally sort of solidified itself in Calcutta. So it has a very, very long history. And that space, in a sense, is a testament to that old historical idea of expansion, but also the the notion of the city as a carcass and human folly. And to a certain extent, maybe it might be interesting to look at the notion of the picture. What is a picture? A picture, to a certain extent, is also a continuous space. It allows other things to enter. It doesn't end at an edge. In the kind of Western pictorial tradition, the picture, to a certain extent, is about experiencing an activity through all our senses. And this highly digitized, highly sort of volatile images, series of images, are about the feeling that you get from your senses. What is going on is heightened. It's nearly sexual. There isn't a kind of interruption by the edge. It goes beyond. Can we go into the next thing? And these are all elements from the architecture that the British left behind. Uh, This is the Victoria Monument in Calcutta, the ironwork. Do carry on. And there's a little girl. This is an, an, the area, the, the red light district from the top, where all sorts of things go on. And this is contemporary. This is not a, a historical image. Of course, uh, the politician, to a large extent, plays a key role, both as a gender and as a figure of power. And this is the last image, um, possibly the biggest um, public artwork in the whole of Asia happens in Calcutta during Durga Puja which is the, 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 the prayer for Durga, the, uh, the, the goddess, where maybe uh, around four to 500 spaces in Calcutta are given over to large artistic constructions of uh, Durga and Kritik. This is the god that the prostitutes pray to so they're never born again as prostitutes. And uh, this is how deep it goes. So, the last artist we will look at is Nandan Gia. Again, Nandan plays with the same idea of the glitch. If you can look at the first image. These are very uh, traditional photographs, um, which in a sense are about information, about transference of knowledge, of heritage. Um, But in a sense... He's playful. It makes it ambiguous. What are these images now doing? Are they, in a sense, about our ancestors? Or is it a formation of an ethnic identity? Are these sort of feudal religious, sort of emblematic images of societies, of caste? So he takes his old images, cuts them up, and introduces this glitch, both in the framing as well as in the 
what do you call this? Um, we call it a mount, the cartouche is a mount, yes. Yeah. So in a funny way, he looks at, in a kind of single stroke, he looks at the semantic or the grammar of how you can interrupt or create an interruption. Um, he, he, he called this series of work the Facebook defacing Facebook or defacebook in a sense defacing Facebook and to a certain extent he goes back to the core of the images and I would suggest in a sense make them makes them or introduces this ambiguity of time place what are they doing is this real is this a shot from a computer. Is this a collage? And in a sense, looks at that sacred place of the visual heritage. These are very expensive photographs, by the way, that he destroys in the process of making these collages. And by doing that, a lot of people are very upset by it. And I think that's part of the process of upsetting people, allowing that not to become something which you just enjoy, but in a sense um, are worried about the process of what it does to the notion of heritage. These are one-offs. They survived so much, and now they've been made into this. And of course, a lot of the time, these are photographs of those who had the ability to be photographed, of the rich or the infamous, or those who were sort of, in a sense, important enough to be part of the photographic discourse. So there's another slippery notion in this of why he thinks he needs to destroy them to some extent or reimagine them. This is Pandit Nehru, who was the first Prime Minister of India. There should be some prints. Politician, I would think, or a soldier. So just, just to sort of try and work towards this talk wasn't geared towards looking at digital as a kind of forum or format, but how the digital has entered in a sense of an aesthetic value, how it's deposited itself in a series of ideas, notions. What is electronic about collages? And to a certain extent, it's a vast subject which we're talking about. This is just a small dig at it. Of course, it needs a lot more discussion to justify it. But there are two or three things we need to think about. One is that we need to sometimes pull back from the realm of looking at art and think about what is actually going on in front of us and think about how do we do that. And curatorially, people do that by looking at certain things which are coming out. In a sense, artists are constantly designing an aesthetic, uh, in a sense, imploding and exploring perceptions. They're making sort of material out of sometimes immaterial ideas, feelings, notions. And in fun, one way, when I was writing this up, I was thinking, is it interesting that we sort of look at uh, 
this great realm of work that artists do? Is it important that it's shown? And of course, as a curator, I believe that it's important for it to be shown. Although there's a large amount of images which exist outside of the art world, I see every day how individual artist work has been, in a sense, being employed, being used, being coalesced into the wider world. I look at shop windows, I look at clothes, I look at many, many things, films, which have used, in, we, I can see where it's coming from, the explorations, the interruptions, the experiments, which artists, individual artists have done in these studios. So the way, in a sense, although we are maybe living in a world which is mediatic, overload, where some things are very simple, or seemingly very simple, and to some extent, we're looking at things which are seen to be classic, modern, postmodern, all of these things, colonial, postcolonial. It's always important to realize that the visual very much is part of our memory, how we realize the world, how we remember the world. And sometimes the visual artists are able to do that without us understanding how we got to it. So sometimes you look at a piece of work, you can't find the rhyme or the reason of why it takes you somewhere else. But it does. And that's the kind of important journey we need to go through by looking at these artists' works. And I really hope in the long term that a lot of these works which I've shown you don't have a rhyme or reason why it was created for you. But it might take you to somewhere else and it might take the world somewhere else. Especially when we're taking so much for granted at the moment. Um, in terms of what we receive and to a large extent of what we don't receive. So I'm going to kind of leave it at that. And hopefully you might have one or two questions. And this light is killing me. <laughs> Maybe we get the house lights on. That's better. Now you know what it feels like when I was... Thank you, Andy. There is a God up there. I think you've... Uh, Russian does with such detail that we're trying to still interpret um, the, the level of conversation and dialogue you bring, Shane. Maybe you can, can come into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind coming into... Away the table, right? I was placed here. Soften. <laughs> you were... Soften the, the intensity I could come of interpretation. No, it's fine. Uh, you're still on the stage. All right. Are there any sort of, uh, sort of immediate thoughts, perhaps, from today's talk? From she, it's very, very insightful, she, firstly. And thank you for taking such time to detail and construct uh, this talk around to the digital new and the aesthetic coming out of Asia, which is very exciting, mm. very new, and takes us away from Bindi's Burfi and Bhangra embodiment, absolutely. Mm. It was the S's and now it's the B's. <laughs> it's all about the B's, it was very much the <laughs> B thing there. Um, but yeah, I think um, something that we're, you know, as a space, and I, and I know you touch, touched upon uh, as, as sort of a hint towards a critique uh, about New Art Exchange itself, and we are always self critiquing here. Mm. about um, the, you know, uh, a space that explores uh, the impossibility into the possibility of having something uh, beyond the notion of, uh, that, uh, of stereotypes and expectations that people have, perceptions. And I think the work that's been presenting here is certainly a new Asia, a confident Asia mm. that takes on the socio-political perspectives. And I'm just wondering, on your travels... Um, is there, is there, are there many parallels in some of the work that you, you're observing um, in coming out of Asia with some of the patterns of, say, digital and aesthetical form of art being produced, say, from here? Mm. Um, 
maybe based on sort of global diaspora of those identities? Put it bluntly, no. No. Um, I used to go to Transmedia every year because it was where I worked. Yes. So for five years I saw it. And it was very much about a larger space occupying. There's, there was a fantastic article by Carol Liu in Freeze once about why do Chinese artists decide to make large-scale works, I mean large-scale works. And what does scale, what is supposed to be the idea behind scale? And I think there, was, there, is, a, there is something to be said about the idea of scale which is used in media. Because it kind of, in a funny way, it's mixed media that comes out of the West a large, large amount of time. What I've shown is media as a kind of necessity to engage with a necessity uh, in a kind of necessity being something which comes out of a lack and that could be a lack of knowledge as well. So, and a lack of resources and the structures in both these countries um, are very, because the governments are against the arts in a funny way. Mm -hmm. um, India's cultural policy and internal sort of look at how it provides cultural resources is very bad. It's willing to take tax for work being sold, but not willing to send work across or do residences or stuff like that. Or provide museums which function. And Iran is the opposite, where it damns anything which comes out, apart from that which has been spoken through the national sort of megaphone. Um, so what happens in the West is that you get things which are much more scaled up and multimedia. So it becomes a kind of spectacle. These are kind of slight nuances and addresses about observations of how media is affecting them on a daily basis. So Baiju, for instance, can make a digital film. He's very cohesive with how to make things technically. But he rather work with painting to be able to survive first because there's no grants and there's nothing else coming your way. And B, it is something which is interesting for him to advocate as a space in trying to reach a larger public because they'll see it, they'll recognize it. So the notion that glitch is interesting and important that it's, t it's turned up in two of the artist's works. And I was kind of interested in the notion of interruption and interrupting aesthetics and interruption of, of, of a sort. But I think in the long term, there aren't the spaces dedicated. There aren't dedicated formatted spaces. You could go to Vienna and you could see maybe two or three installations a week which are sound-based, which are performance-based, which have got video, sound, everything rolled into one. You could go to maybe half a dozen museums in Britain anytime and see large-scale works like that. But in, in India, possibly once a year, twice a year. More now, but less and less. Over the last or 10 years, it was very little. But getting gathering momentum, as we speak. I was also interested in your term, sort of, Jitesh, I think it was, he was talking about geographical tagging, mm. duration through that. What did you mean by this? Exactly. Well, I did, now, no, we are all, I mean, I've produced around 10 to 15 catalogues. Yes. And you work with designers, you introduce them certain ideas, they take it off, and then they, you come back with certain results. When you look at them, you realize they've taken up certain aspects which are interesting symbolically. So calligraphic, mm -hmm. for instance, would be the first thing. When you introduce them to a country which has a Muslim tradition or a calligraphic tradition, they'll use that immediately mm -hmm. as a way. The Indianization, the Sanskritization of words, yes. stuff like that, the Arabic. So if you look at Hajj at the moment, which yes. is at the British Museum, you'll see it all over. Right. You'll see the little nuances if you look at it carefully. Uh -huh. um, why certain things are used, employed, and not other things. So there's a sense, there's a lack of modernity or postmodern around issues to do with a certain culture so that you can attract that sort of traditional crowd. But there is a big relationship between tradition and modernity, especially in Asia, because it's, 
tradition goes into modernity. It's not this is that. It's a museum that makes something tradition and something modern. And I think this is a big debate which is going on. So, for instance, you go to something like Indonesia, uh, there'll be, you know, gamelan, new compositions for gamelan concerts all the time. So it's not like they think of this, oh, this is tradition, so we won't have new composers making for gamelan. Gamelan is composed for now. It's not something which is played, which was played in 14th century or 15th century. Composers now are composing in Java, um, in Sumatra, different compositions, but com contemporary. So the notion of modernity and tradition, it's, if it falls into one seamlessly, yes. then people have trouble in the West. Because yes. it's nice to see something which is there, something there. So it, it, when, when the compartments are somehow fluid, mm -hmm. it becomes a problem. But here, going back to your question, yes. is that the idea is that I think it's, it's very interesting how we make certain things ethnic. Mm -hmm. So possibly I wasn't here for the opening, but I'm sure there was a lot of Pakistani food, which I heard about. But that's... that's <laughs> we did anyway. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but, you know, there is this, this notion of how do we give it? Where do we stop and where do we start? You know... If there was a Chinese exhibition, do we have to serve Chinese food and drinks? Or can we do the same as you would do a German exhibition, which is you go off and buy some wine and serve some sandwiches or whatever? We only do that because our chefs from Karachi. Yes. So we go with her flow. I know, I know. But I know what you're saying. You, you, I hear what you're saying. It's about, um, you know, what we don't want to do is block and pigeonhole artists because of their ethnic identity. What we're looking at here is artists who are exploring particular aesthetical form and particular particular angle in, of their work. And you know, we've seen here some very politically charged artists because of the environment they're in and that's their story and that's their, their expression. Mm. Could, the, um, could the dish be seen as a kind of a defense mechanism as a, in terms of uh, being snowed in the West certainly with images, you know, seen as a kind of self-defense mechanism in the context of the East as opposed to the West. You know, in terms of the fact that we're, we're, we're simulating images all the time, right? We're simulating, we're actually, there's cultural, a, a, a kind of cultural period in going and how we take these images from the East as well. We simulate them as if they lose any kind of meaning at the mm -hmm. time that makes them traditional. You see as a kind of... Now, I, I, when I put, because I had a number of artists I was looking at at the same time, and to select, I was going to work with five and then I put six together. And then all of a sudden two came up with this glitch. And I thought, what does it mean? In a funny way. Yeah. Um, and I like the notion of a glitch. I like the notion that it's an interruption of a, uh, something which is recognizable but becomes something else. Mm -hmm. um, it's another, another level of pictorial field that you're playing with because it, it lies on top of everything else. So in a painting or in a collage, it's the last yeah, thing, it's the last yeah. level. Yeah. So in a funny way, it also talks about time mm. as a last level. So it brings in the notion of time. Mm. So there's a lot of different things that it comes up with. It's about technology, it's about interruption, it's about heritage, it's about the way that we, we, we transmit something. Um, it's a reminder as well that seeing is not believing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it sort of it, it it's also interrupts your seeing, like those Facebook tabs that he uses. You know, it stops you from <clears throat> getting into the image and saying there is actually a force field which is going to stop you from from going any deeper. So possibly, it, you know, I, I, I mean, I need to think more about it. But I do like the idea of the glitch um, because the glitch uh, is has the potential for it to mean many things. And it's not only a political, it's also a treatment of how we receive images every day. I mean, you know, it's now, we're, we're yeah, looking the, at the images. The thing I didn't like is that the, the imagery, the visual imagery in the India, is based on certain iconic figures mm -hmm. all the time, whether it's religious or political. And it, it, it just used the same iconic figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I think this work, this, this last work is young still. Um, he's, he's A, based in Jaipur, which I don't know how much you know about India, but it's like possibly one of the centers of, of miniature paintings, still very much alive as, as an art form. Jaipur has got a large amount of photographic material lodged. I mean, the whole of Rajasthan has. You can find a lot of photographic and traditional painting to buy. His father is a buyer and seller of this material. So he goes all over Rajasthan buying this stuff and finding the best. So he has already an inroad by where he is and what his family is involved in to be able to look at this material and know about it and why he wants to use it. So he has his own personal sort of history. Uh, of, he sometimes deliberately destroys something which is old and deliberately something which might affect his father a bit, I think, because his father sort of treats this as money. These images are very valuable. You know, you can never get another one like this. And historically, there was... I've got to get this right, a de Kooning drawing, which is rubbed out by a very important artist in New York. And the Chapman brothers altered some prints by Goya. So there is a trajectory of artworks done by other artists being used as a starting point, deposit something else into them to make them new and fresh and regurgitate that history in a sense. So I think there is that trajectory being played out. Whether he's knowingly doing it or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is that it can have that history. Anything? the discourses of these artists would um, present it to this community, how they would be received. Mm. That's what would interest me. Mm. Because yes, they are talking about things that are very, very global mm. and mean a lot to a lot of people. But for me, that's my question. Mm. Good point. I mean, it's interesting because I was just, just earlier, mm. um, we had a, a visit by the Shadow in mainstream culture, Dan Jarvis in Nottingham, Nottingham Contemporary, who's here. Mm. We're talking about international perspective and its reality to uh, a place like Highsbury on the front line where the street never lies, and how do you make this work uh, a reality? I, I know we're going beyond the digital aesthetic, but we are talking about Asia as, as it is today and as it is in terms of contemporary art, mm. and how, how would that? You know, cause, because one of the remits that we, we are trying to achieve here is about um, bringing in uh, a new sense of understanding uh, on, on how the global world is changing and, and even stimulating new perspectives around diverse perspectives beyond you know, what has been known. Yeah. And certainly moving out of you know, 80s, 90s politics around race and culture. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you. You know, is, is, how is that received in the home countries? Mm. So, so, for example, in India and Iran, mm. um, there is a real you know, gravitas and critical mass of contemporary artists coming out of this. I mean, early, a couple of days back, there was an amazing conference in Delhi called Unbox. Yeah. Which is, is about, you know, real critical dialogue around mm. you know, new ways of thinking and 
you know, how, how is it received in countries like that with the poverty and, uh, you know, and also, you know, distance between class and caste is so apparent? And we still have that in Britain. I mean, there are two, there are two points. One is that I think they just worked out that the Indian art fair, which happened in January, yes. was the most visited art fair in the world. Right. Last year I was there, they were getting about 10,000 people a day. But that's nothing compared for India, which has a population of 1 billion. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a good turnout, but it's a big population. Um, but in terms of the fact that the number of people who walk in to see contemporary art is that great. And possibly the most visited Biennale in the world, after maybe Venice, is, is the Sao Paulo Biennale. So, in that sense, what happens in density is much greater outside of Europe or in the West. Um, I think we, we, we live in a very loaded idea of what the globe is because we see the West as a center, because we see how everything good has come out of Rome and ideas and philosophy and Greece and, and then giving birth to free America. So, you know, there is a kind of a strange idea of the world that we built and how it's become kind of centrifugal. But now that's kind of exploding because there's so much people are beginning to understand about what's going on in contemporary, within the contemporary in the world. Um, the Chinese art world is incredibly thriving. There are going to be at least four to five museums per city in the next decade, um, which is the equivalent of maybe all the museums in all of Europe in one, one country. So, you know, the, the, the density and the amount of what is inside it and how it's placed and how it works itself out are different things. Now, I know when I did the Guangzhou Biennale, there was th at least three quarters of a million people walked through the door through this one Biennale. But they walked in a path which was preconceived and walked out. So there wasn't a sense of engagement that you feel to some extent certain other Biennales have with the artwork, they walk in. You can count them, but it doesn't necessarily mean it affects them. And I think that's the next sort of level. It's a bit like the Chinese goods, you know, they exploded around the world, they gave us cheap socks, and now they're giving us cheap phones. It's an upgrading, yeah? And I think that upgrading will come culturally as well. Um, and I think it's very exciting, to be honest, what's going on in Asia. Now, how that translates here is very different because... Most people don't have an ac access to contemporary Asia. We have access to a secondary Asia, like people like me who come here and give you an idea. Yes. I think it's important that, like when Rashid was here, to mm -hmm. give an idea of why he's doing what he's doing, what it means to, to work in Pakistan, and how does he do it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to have people coming here and people going there. So an exchange, a real exchange, it's necessary for artists who can then bring experiences and ideas back and forth. So the idea of globalization is not the movement, the movement of goods and people. It's also the movement of ideas and philosophies. And I think that second part is less so at the moment. We don't have... I mean, you could go to any art college. They wouldn't have a clue. I mean, in the library, you won't find one catalog from China. And most probably Chinese, Chinese produce at least two catalogs per exhibition. So at the age of like 21, 23, they've like got five catalogs each. They produce catalogs like, you know, everybody's got a catalog. Here you're 30 and you don't have a catalog. At 23, you have five. And they're all monograph shows and everything. Because they have this, they can print it, they can get it, they can design it, they can, you know, it's done. And it's done in four days. Here it takes a month. So... It's really fast. It's really there. Yeah. So there's a lot of material, but it doesn't reach. We don't have a great distribution in the West of things which come from outside. You could go to any of the Koinig bookshops. You'll get anything from a little suburb from Vienna, from Poland, but from India, Pakistan, China, Thailand, nothing. You'd be lucky. So there's, this, like, there's just no desire to include 
any of that because it's supposedly so different. But it's happening. And that's the kind of strange... But increasingly we're seeing in our galleries across the country... Who can sell? Well, there is a sell, but the, 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 in, in, some words, in some ways the import of uh, cultural practice and cultural presentation of different artists... You know, um, surely the, 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 the um, market is opening in that sense. You don't think so? No. 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 Sorry. I think the market is only as open as the pocket. Yeah, I agree with that. Hmm? I agree with that. But I'd say that's the number one reason for that. When, when the economy makes it a viable option to buy into the Indian or Chinese market, then it will happen. Like it did with historic art in Japan or China, worthless until the 70s. Then people start buying it. Then people want to look at it. Then all of a sudden it's very expensive. Mm. Mm-hmm. The thing is, it's not... It, but at, the moment, no, at the moment, Chinese art is as expensive. Yes, but they're buying their own work. Yeah. That's the thing. And they have the money to. Exactly, yeah. And you see, there's a very interesting article in The Guardian today by... Uh, God, what's with me with names today? Uh, Mbeto Echo. Um, and he talked something about... Uh, this relationship between um, the ability to how do we how, you know Europe he suggests is mainly made up the idea of Europe is made out of an economy Europe mm-hmm. not a cultural Europe and I think that's what he suggests is a very bad bad mistake is that European Union is about economic trade rather than the culture because we are still got French culture and Italian culture and British culture and British culture is really sort of separated from the rest. It depends what country you're in though, doesn't it? No, but even like when I was in Germany for five years, German culture was it. Mm. We'd, in those five years, I saw two British artists from the YBA show in Berlin when, when, when YBA was big. So it kind of shows that there is a kind of a lack of acknowledgement of something which is profoundly interesting coming across. But who was YBA profoundly interesting to? Who to, said that it was big? It was big. Yeah. Now, please. Well, it produced the richest group of artists Britain has produced within five years, ever. Mm. Uh, you know? Yeah. And in terms of rich being powerful mm. and having the, the, the kudos to be able to be visible, then it was, it was important. And there are some key works which have come out of it. We cannot underrate that. No, but even so, too, is you only need a handful for it to be important. No, I think there was some really interesting work that came out at that time. Some, and, and I saw a number of, in comparison to say, American artists, especially from the West Coast, a lot of them were over in Berlin, mm-hmm. showed in Berlin. So in a sense, it's what comes across and what is allowed to come across, especially museum policies. So, I mean, I, I, I see very in often good shows from Asia in this country We've had one show, survey show from China so far at the VNA. Is it a temptation that the West wants to discover things, and if they didn't discover it, it's not as interesting? Them. You know, the idea that Chinese are buying Chinese art, that the Indians have a few in their own shows. No, the, the thing is, I think it's not about Chinese art, it's artists from China, mm. which is a big difference. If we call it Chinese art, it becomes an entity. And that's problematic. I'm talking about artists from China who are interesting because of what they're doing and what they're saying in terms of sculpture, in terms of installation, in terms of just even painting. And I think there was a time when there was artists from Japan who were acknowledged, and photographers from Japan who were acknowledged for the innovation (coughs) that they made in photographic discourse. There was a very short period of time. And you have a big show coming up at, in Birmingham, which will discuss some of the sort of 1950s and 60s performance work from Japan, which influenced New York School, which influenced New York School, not the other way around. Yeah? So that, that starts to make sense. And that, in a sense, is a kind of poetic discussion 
that's what I think is interesting, is the, the poetic of relationships and discourse, not the, the geography of where it comes from and where it originates and where it goes. I think there should be a kind of more global acknowledgement that the Gutai did some brilliant work in Tokyo in 1950-something, 7, 61, and that it went to New York afterwards. Not that everything came out of New York and went to Asia, which is, I think, the unevenness of art history at the moment. And that needs to be acknowledged and rewritten. And that we're not teaching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So I think it's one of the biggest words about Ender here was probably Midnight's Children. Mid- <laughs> I mean, that's not the case. Literally, when Midnight's Children, which is biologically banned, in India, as well as this, I think a lot of the public space, a lot of the art galleries here are quite independent, but they're also linked to the political establishment. No, it's a very, it's a very true point, and I think you know, midnight children change British literature. Mm. You know, it was it was that kind of moment of Beckett arriving, you know, kind of colonial mm. voice. It was difficult to buy in India. Yeah, it was difficult for him to be in India. Mm-hmm. Even now, as you know, that he was not allowed to go to the Jaipur yes. fest, uh, Literature Festival. Yes. Thank you for staying. Go back to your European art in the past, how they came around to actually agree that they influenced by the Japanese, something art in the 19th century. This is a way of it, so from a Western perspective. And, and there again, you still get things said comparatively recently by, you know, by people that, in the art publishers that, well, take Indian painting, but that's it, all due to the French impression. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you know, to a certain extent, I think partly the institu- there isn't an ins- a progressive institutional institu- institutionalization mm-hmm. of its own art in Asia, um, which would allow people to see a comprehensive picture of an artist's production. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So, for instance, if you go to a one-person show, which will be at the moment at the National Portrait Gallery, I think it's the Lucien Foy, and the drawings in, in Lenin and Southern, uh, you get a very good picture. Or even if you go to Zarina Hash, uh, Bimji's exhibition at the White Chapel, you get a picture of an artist's production over a period of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. That is not really happening in Asia to the level it should be. Where there's an absolute apt discussion about what is this this person been doing? How do we look at it? What does it mean in front of us as a body of work? That will take time. It's only now that India, the National Gallery of Modern Art, is putting exhibitions of artists who died maybe 30 years ago. So the Ramkinka Bay has just opened this last week. In, in Delhi, and like that figure has already, in a sense, a large amount of work, incredible work, very important work, but it's taken, you know, 2012 to get it on. Um, so I think there is a there is a profound sort of lag uh, of its own understanding of how to cohesively place something in front of its own public, um, and and. and that's, that's problematic. So here, we, you know, in, in, like in China, as I said, they do a lot of one-person shows, but sometimes it's maybe too early. And so it's pitching it too quickly and it becomes problematic where one after the other you're getting this big show is robust and you're not quite sure what you're looking at because it's not cohesive. It's not like, you know, astutely been thought through picked through and curated in a way where it makes sense. Sometimes, but a lot of times, not necessarily. 
Yeah, the, the, the next Berlin Biennale, for instance, uh, which is going to be curated by a Polish artist, uh, Arta, Arta Zumiski, and co-curated by a, a Russian group called Woin. And both of them have come from working as political activists, not only in Poland and Russia, but how their work has surfaced, in, especially in Eastern Europe and in Germany. Um, so I think what's kind of interesting about that Biennale is that, or what will be possibly interesting about this Biennale, is that it provides a mirror to what supposedly is going on in Berlin in terms of socially engaged artists and what it is to curate something on that scale, on a large scale as a Biennale. It will be a lot of conferences, a lot of talks, a lot of sort of pamphleting, rather than this relationship to viewing art as the traditional exhibition is downstairs. Mm -hmm. So I think there'll be less of that and more of this. Yeah? So the kind of the workshop. So this becomes, in a sense, a forum for art discussion, and therefore art in its own right. Yeah. And I think that that is one of the ways that art is developing, is that you know, some people are saying, I'm tired of putting an object into the world, which has got maybe too many objects for us to realize what they mean anymore. So what might be interesting is what are we looking at and how are we looking at it. So then that becomes the sort of point of activism, in a sense, to allow people to have a comprehensive understanding of the notion of art and what makes the art a community. Yes, but also, presumably, well, from what you said about the digital image being filtered down and that you see it in all sorts of places, that there should maybe become a point where the public becomes the artist and is throwing it straight back at the artist. Yeah. And in that sense, that, that creates the dialogue and the activism becomes, to me, maybe more dynamic. Than yeah. um, I think, again, going back to this, this the, the format of this BNL, uh, one of the things they did was they asked any artist to make a proposal and they would they said they would select so many. They said now, to be democratic, we've selected everything. Now, whether that, that is part of the idea of a kind of cultural democracy, the notion of cultural democracy, and therefore being activist rather than hierarchical. Um, so th these are the kind of differentiations in, in, in tactics of activism because, in a sense, it's about action rather than possibly the action of teaching and creating knowledge and education rather than creating something which is for sale. Yeah. yeah? So then it becomes a kind of... I mean, and, and possibly some of the people who have done this are selling at a very good rate as well because the art world is like that. It's, it starts consuming whatever comes out to a large extent and becomes very successful. And not consuming necessarily from a, from a, from a commercial realm, but from giving museum commissions and giving very large resources to certain artist groups and spaces. So, you know, it's, it, I think all artists are activists by the mere fact that you're working with impossible. You know, I'm always surprised um, how 
a piece of wood can become so important to the rest of the world. It's, 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 it's incredible, you know, or a stone, or some or ink. Just like in the rest of the world. No, I mean, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people now understand a lot of work by Duchamp, for instance. And not only in the artistic community, but I think his ideas, his philosophy of why he did it. No, but there is, um, that, you know, if you look at China and India, if you go to exhibitions there, we're talking about, I'll pick up on that point, you know, there is something that, 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 that hugely immoral about, um, you have this again, this kind of duality going on, creative people, um, the momentum, economic momentum that's, uh, that we've seen those two countries particularly have produced a generation of people who have been completely twisted in their heads about the value of money. And uh, these are the people that you see buying these work. This, this movement that we're talking about is in India that's taking place of artists. What is the impetus behind their work? Is it this production line that they're becoming part of? Because they know that they're incredibly wealthy people who, who will just go with the flow. Mm. Whether their aspirations are uh, Western they're kind of catching up and starting to buy things or how do artists cope with that when they produce work that is incredibly personal um, has been through a journey and then they end up showing exhibiting in the gallery where people literally just come with their checkbooks but there's absolutely no relationship between that and what they're producing the, you know I, I can't remember I think Fellini talked about um not talked about, he showed a funeral where all these women in black gowns come and cry. And they're paid to cry. Mm. And I think some of these artists are paid to make work like that. So they cry <laughs> about their personal... <laughs> and I think it's, it's a training. Because the, the strange thing is that a lot of these artists realize that like, they become like athletes and they only have like five or six years where they can perform at their no, the best. The parallel that I draw is that they are not Bob Dylan, but they're Rebecca Ferguson from X Factor. So that's the parallel that I draw. I used to know Rebecca, so be careful. No, but I think, no, what I mean is that, you see, it's very... Is that the reason why we're seeing this increase in, in countries like China and India? Is, is, is that the reason? Behind no, no, no. I, don't, I, I, think, I think the market has taken over from the institution mm. as the enabler of what the discourse is. And that happened in the 80s, sort of close touch up. Mm. It can be tracked back to that point. Mm. It's the same with property. Possibly what we don't realize is um, the greatest asset that a collector has is the ability to take wealth across a border. Um, so I think those people who collect rare coins and stamps are the most cleverest people because nobody will ever know that they've got like 50,000 pounds in their wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's that moment where people have to take wealth across the border very easily because property at the end was <coughs> viable to do that through. That, that accruement of wealth mm -hmm. then became so we've seen things like you know, two days ago, yesterday, uh, Henry Moore, which nobody wanted mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. Oh, Henry Moore. <laughs> um, and now it fetched how many million? Mm -hmm. 10, 15. Um, and that that's sort of talks about the notion of crewing something. Um, there's a moment where culture and, and, and art, especially in China, became very important, was there was a company that set up lending of Andy Warhol paintings to Chinese banks and companies because they would put up this painting in their wardroom. Mm -hmm. And when they're doing business with the rest of the world, they say, oh, Andy Warhol, he knows about culture. And they would make business. And so Andy Warhol became very big symbolically in China. A lot of companies borrowed them. 
for long periods for the, for the uh, he's a favorite to create that bridging mechanism because language is still a bit difficult to mm. but culture can play that role mm. if you can understand in the war yeah. then there is something very important mm -hmm. about doing business with this person art is a brand leader all right, listen. So, folks, next next one is on censorship. I hope you come. Yeah. And I hope it doesn't snow. The date for that, hopefully, it won't be snowing in March. Is fifteenth of March. It's a Thursday. Um, it's seven o'clock. Do come along. And can I, on behalf of New York Exchange, thank you, Shane, for a very. Yeah.